The following is a truncated version of This Week in Amateur Radio. Please visit TWIAR.net for the full version. Now in our 21st year of service to the amateur radio community worldwide, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1131 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The ARRL is urging its members to join in strongly opposing the FCC's license application and renewal fee proposal. It's a wrap for yet another session of the Hurricane WatchNet as they stand down from Hurricane Zeta. Radio amateurs in western Pennsylvania will be on the air commemorating the centennial of KDKA Radio. A Vermont radio amateur tries again by filing a revised tower construction plan in his community. New Zealand amateurs lose access to the 60-meter band. Meanwhile, Peru is selling off amateur spectrum to wireless providers. The FCC gives a big thumbs up to all digital AM broadcasting. And if one congresswoman gets her bill approved, amateur radio operators will have their own national day. We will have all the details in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill relates a great story as he recalls his visit to the land of nothing. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about those pre-winter tower inspections you should be doing now. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in snow-covered pre-winter preview, thanks to Hurricane Zeta, we got about four inches out there. Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from along the southern edge of Lake Ontario in Rochester, New York, and wishing everyone a very happy Halloween, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where I've had to beat the encrusted ice off my dipole antenna, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Troy, New York, where the ice is already beginning to coat the antennas, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in historic Armory Square, downtown Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, where winter is slowly approaching, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we're wringing ourselves out after six and a half inches of rain, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Headlining our news this week, ARRL will file comments in firm opposition to a Federal Communications Commission proposal to impose a $50 fee on amateur radio license and application fees. With more details on this story, we go to League Headquarters, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. With the comment deadlines fast approaching, ARRL urges members to add their voices to the leagues by filing opposition comments of their own. The FCC Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, uh, NPRM as it's called, in MD Docket 20-270, appeared in the October 15th edition of the Federal Register. It sets deadlines of November 16th to comment and November 30th to post reply comments, which are comments on comments already filed. A lot of people have already filed comments in this proceeding. ARRL has prepared a guide to filing comments with the FCC at ARRL.org forward slash FCC hyphen fees 
hyphen proposal that includes tips for preparing comments and step-by-step -step filing instructions. Under the proposal, amateur radio licensees would pay a $50 fee for each amateur radio application for new licenses, license renewals, upgrades to existing licenses, and vanity call sign requests. The FCC also has proposed a $50 fee to obtain a printed copy of your license. The FCC proposal affects all FCC services, not just amateur radio. File comments on MD Docket 20-270 using the FCC's Electronic Comment Filing System. Excluded are applications for administrative updates, such as changes of address and annual regulatory fees. Amateur service licensees have been exempt from application fees for several years. The FCC proposal is contained in a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking in MD Docket 20-270, which was adopted to implement portions of the Repack Airwaves yielding better access for users of Modern Services Act of 2018, the so-called Raybombs Act. The Act requires that the FCC switch from a congressionally mandated fee structure to a cost-based system of assessment. In its Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, the FCC proposed application fees for a broad range of services that use the FCC's universal licensing system, including the amateur radio service. The 2018 statute excludes the amateur service from annual regulatory fees, but not from application fees. The FCC proposal affects all FCC services and does not single out amateur radio. ARRL is encouraging members to file comments that stress amateur radio's contributions to the country and communities. ARRL's Guide to Filing Comments includes talking points that may be helpful in preparing comments. These stress amateur radio's role in volunteering communication support during disasters and emergencies, and inspiring students to pursue education and careers in engineering, radio technology, and communications. As the FCC explained in its Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, Congress, through the Ray Bombs Act, is compelling regulatory agencies such as the FCC to recover from applicants the costs involved in filing and handling applications. The FCC is not proposing to charge for administrative updates, such as mailing address changes for amateur applications, and amateur radio will remain exempt from annual regulatory fees. For administrative updates and modifications, which also are highly automated, we find that it is in the public interest to encourage licensees to update their own information without a charge, the FCC said. In its Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, the FCC encouraged licensees to update their own information online without charge. Many, if not most, amateur service applications may be handled via the largely automated Universal License Service. The Ray Bombs Act does not exempt filing fees in the amateur radio service, and the FCC stopped assessing fees for vanity call signs several years ago. You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. After an activation that lasted more than nine hours, the Hurricane Watch Net suspended operations on October 28th at around 0130 UTC. Although Zeta was still a hurricane just east of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, moving to the northeast at about 30 miles per hour, we hated to close operations, but propagation on 20 and 40 meters was totally gone, Hurricane Watch Net Manager Bobby Graves, KB5HAV, said. The turnout of reporting stations was great, but we can always use more. Meteorologists love weather data. So we do our best to collect and forward as much as we can. Aries teams in Louisiana went on standby status on October 27th, ready to activate at the request of local emergency management officials or served agencies. At midday on Wednesday, the Louisiana Emergency Net was placed on active standby status on 
and 7.255 MHz, concluding operations at 2100 UTC on Wednesday. The Northern Florida Aries Net convened on October 28th on 3.950 MHz for about 12 hours in anticipation of tropical storm winds and a risk of tornado activity. Our HF net shut down this morning. Northern Florida Section Emergency Coordinator Carl Martin, K4HBN, said. The counties closed shelters and had their Aries groups stand down soon after. Martin said operators did cover three shelters. We had challenges due to HF conditions, and one of the Aries groups lost a repeater and had to go to a backup plan. In George County, Mississippi, Aries Emergency Coordinator General Daly, KD4VVZ, suspended routine net traffic to take storm-related reports such as weather data, property damage, and power status. Daly said repeater net would remain active for 12 hours and the information would be relayed to weather forecasters. The net prepared to carry occasional digital traffic. As the sun comes up, damage assessments are still ongoing, the George County Sheriff's Office announced on the George County Aries Facebook page. Currently, a majority of the county is without power. The sheriff reported many downed trees and power lines and advised against non-essential travel. WH4NHC at the National Hurricane Center in Miami activated at 1600 UTC on October 28th, monitoring Hurricane WatchNet's frequencies of 14.325 and 7.268 MHz, as well as the VOIP, Hurricane Net, and other resources. The net funnels ground truth reports to National Hurricane Center forecasters. Ham aid emergency communication kits from ARRL had been prepositioned in Louisiana in preparation for this event. Hurricane WatchNet manager Graves went on to say that 2020 has been a well above average season for tropical cyclones, with half of the systems that developed making landfall. Adding to the pandemic that all have had to deal with, we as amateur radio operators have had to deal with very poor propagation thanks in part to what has seemed to be a never-ending solar minimum. Graves said the number of Hurricane WatchNet check-ins also is down, a factor he also attributed to less-than-ideal propagation. He said the National Hurricane Center really depends on the information radio amateurs on his net collect. He reminded that hurricane season doesn't end officially until November 30th, but nature doesn't respect the calendar. Tropical systems can and have formed during every month, he said. In 2005, Zeta didn't form until the last week of December and lasted into January. Also, we still have many more Greek names to use, but I sure hope we don't have to see the one named Eta, which is the next letter in the Greek alphabet. Pittsburgh radio station KDKA will celebrate 100 years of radio broadcasting in November, and Pennsylvania radio amateurs will honor that milestone in a multi-station special event. KDKA dates its broadcasting history to the airing of the Harding-Cox presidential results on November 2, 1920, and the station has been on the air ever since. The special event, which will involve the operation of four stations, will run through the entire month of November. More than 100 years ago, many experimenters started delving into a new technology known as wireless, or radio, said Bob Estone, WC3O, radio officer for the Skyview Radio Society in New Kensington, Pennsylvania. Bastone explained that many of those early pioneers were radio amateurs. 100 plus years later, many amateur radio operators are still contributing to wireless technology while also serving their communities enhancing international goodwill. Congratulations to KDKA Radio, also known in the early years as amateur radio stations 8XK, 8ZZ, and W8XK. Special event stations K3K, K3D, K3A, and W8XK will set up and operate at several locations in Pennsylvania during November. Stations will determine their own modes and schedules. Visit the W8XK profile on QRZ.com for information on certificates and QSLs. What became KDKA initially began broadcasting in 1916 as amateur radio station 8XK licensed by the Federal Radio Commission the predecessor to the Federal Communications Commission. At the time, amateurs were not prohibited from broadcasting. 
The small station was operated by Dr. Frank Conrad, who was Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company Assistant Chief Engineer. The transmitter ran 75 watts, and the broadcasts gained some popularity in Pittsburgh. During World War I, amateur radio operation was suspended due to national security concerns. After the war, 8XK was reorganized as a commercial AM radio station, KDKA. The first transmissions of KDKA originated in a makeshift studio on the roof of Westinghouse K Building in East Pittsburgh. Ham radio clubs participating in the Centennial Special Event include the North Hills Amateur Radio Club in Pittsburgh, which is planning to operate from 26 Incorporated, located in Satsingburg, Pennsylvania, the former KDKA transmitter site from 1931 to 1939. In addition to the North Hills ARC and Skyview Radio Society, other clubs taking part include the Panther Amateur Radio Club, Steel City Amateur Radio Club, the Wireless Association of South Hills, the Butler County Amateur Radio Public Service Group, and the Washington Amateur Communications Radio Club. Individual radio amateurs will operate from their own stations, and a small group of hams is planning a portable operation from South Park in suburban Pittsburgh. Stations will invite the public to visit, while observing the required social distancing protocols. Bastone said that the special event stations will exchange QSL cards with hams who confirm radio contacts. A commemorative QSL card has been produced with artwork designed by the Graphic Arts Department at KDKA Radio. We amateur radio operators look forward to contacting thousands of other hams around the world to celebrate this huge milestone in the commercial broadcasting industry, said Bestone. For more information about the KDKA Centennial and a schedule for the ham radio special event stations including locations, operating frequencies, and how to obtain a commemorative certificate, visit www.kdka100.org. Information is also available in the Special Events Station section, both on the ARRL website and in QST Magazine. Team members may operate from their home stations in conjunction with the multi-operator station. Their home station must be located within a radius of 100 kilometers at 62 miles of the multi-operator contest station. The home station must be located within the same DXCC entity as the multi-operator contest station. And in the case of U.S. and Canadian stations, all team member stations must be in the same U.S. state or Canadian province. All team member stations must use the same call sign and exchange as the multi-operator contest station for the duration of the contest. Logging software must be networked so that all team member stations are using a common log. Individual operators may not work the multi-operator contest station or other team member stations using a personal call sign or other call sign. All multi-operator rules such as band changes and number of signals on a band still apply. See the full contest rules for details. The contest team must determine and control band assignments, ensuring that no more than one team station is transmitting on any given band at a time. The multi-op contest station may be staffed with at less than full capacity while maintaining safe practices, so operating with a combination of team members at home stations and team members at the contest station is permissible. The CW contest takes place on the full third weekend in February. That would be February 20th and 21st. The phone contest takes place on the first full weekend of March, and that will be on March 6th and 7th of 2021. If you have any questions, contact the ARRL contest branch. A radio repeater being used by firefighters at the massive Williams Fork fire in Colorado has been vandalized. The United States Forest Service is investigating after one of its temporary repeater sites was destroyed in early October, rendering the radios of firefighters useless as they struggled against the blaze which is believed to have been started in August as a result of human activity. The firefighters were using the radios to communicate with their command post. The fire burned more than 14,000 acres, but no evacuation orders were given. According to news reports, firefighters found the repeater in pieces with the guy wires cut. The antenna had been snapped off. Replacement parts were found 
and repairs were made, but the Forest Service is continuing its probe. The Radio Society of Great Britain receives complaints from time to time regarding incidences of deliberate jamming and foul or inappropriate language on the air. The Operating Advisory Service provides advice on the Radio Society of Great Britain's website on how to deal with these problems. The Society has been trying to quantify the size of the problem and recently made a Freedom of Information request to Ofcom asking for the number of reports that had been submitted relating to the amateur radio service between January 1st of 2015 and December 31st of 2019. Ofcom's records logged only three identifiable reports of this type during that period. The Radio Society of Great Britain would like to hear from radio amateurs who have reported similar problems directly to Ofcom after following OAS's advice during that same time period. The report should only cover deliberate jamming, the use of foul language, or a language that would be considered a hate crime, as defined by the Crown Prosecution Service Procurator Fiscal. It's important that you can fully document your complaint to Ofcom with dates, the method of complaint, and Ofcom's response. Business News Americas reports that Peru's Ministry for Transport and Communications, the MTC, plans to sell off amateur radio frequencies for 5G mobile in the 3.3 to 3.8 gigahertz band. A part of this spectrum is used by radio hams and radio location services in Peru, as well as in many other countries around the world. Last week, the MTC modified the National Frequency Allocation Plan to allow carriers to provide some services other than those originally assigned for the spectrum. Peru expects to launch a spectrum tender for 5G technology in the first half of next year, awarding frequencies in the 3.3 to 3.8 gigahertz range and the 24.2 to 25.5 gigahertz range. We are radio hobbyists, radio enthusiasts, even radio geeks. Whether it's amateur radio, CB, shortwave, scanning, GMRS, FRS, or all of the above, radio is part of our daily lives. Mobile radios are in our cars, HTs are on our belts, and some room in our apartment or house is crammed floor to ceiling with radios. In fact, for some of us, Radio is a 24-7, 365 avocation. We are constantly searching, scanning, or scouring the RF spectrum for signals. We become agitated when our receivers are silent. In fact, silence is the last thing we want from our radios. Or is it? Could it be that someone in our midst has been on a 20-year search for nothing? The answer is yes. I am that person, and I achieved that goal in August of 2005. It all began in the early 1980s. My job requires a lot of travel. I was on the road somewhere in north-central Pennsylvania, which, except for northern Maine, is the most sparsely populated area in the northeast. My car at the time was equipped with a 2-meter rig, a 40-channel CB, and the usual AM-FM radio. As I drove, I had all the radios in the scan mode when I realized that I was receiving nothing. From 540 to 1610 kHz, 26.965 to 27.405 MHz, 88 to 108 MHz, and 144 to 148 MHz, I heard nothing. No signals, no RF, just silence. This phenomenon continued for 30 miles until the car radio locked in on a local FM station. I began to wonder, with literally millions of radio and television transmitters simultaneously on the air worldwide, was there any place on the planet that was still devoid of RF signals? Could I ever find such a place? It would be difficult, if not impossible. Nevertheless, I promised myself that someday I would find it. My quest became more difficult in the late 1980s when I installed several more radios in my car. I had now continuous receive from 540 kilohertz all the way up through 928 megahertz, including cellular. My job required travel throughout the eastern United States. Even in the most desolate areas of West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee, I heard stations pouring in on shortwave 
In fact, as I traveled into uncharted, unpopulated territory, I became rare DX on the 14.336 MHz County Hunters Net. Stations by the dozens eagerly called me. On 40 meters, the eCars net on 7.255 MHz was full scale. I was a regular check-in with only 50 watts and a hamstick antenna. 10 meters was wide open, and I worked the world on sideband, as well as 10 meter FM repeaters hundreds of miles away. When 6 meters opened via eSkip, I worked stations in almost 20 states. From the middle of nowhere, I was connected. I was not in the land of nothing. In February of 2002, I was sent to Phoenix, Arizona on a four-week assignment. I flew out there with dual-band extended receive HTs, a CB walkie-talkie, and a Yaesu FT817, which covered the full shortwave spectrum as well as 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. I rented a car and spent the weekend exploring the mountains and deserts of Arizona and New Mexico. I found many areas without CB, AM, FM, VHF, and cellular signals. But once again, shortwave pulled through. Even though the sunspots were declining, I always found the shortwave bands alive. With only 5 watts out of the FT817 and telescopic 20, 17, 15, 10, and 6 meter antennas, I worked numerous stations thousands of miles away. I earned my 1010 number from a location devoid of all life forms in the Arizona desert, just 500 feet from the Mexican border. I was thrilled with the performance of the FT817, but once again, even though I was in an unpopulated, inhospitable area, I was not in the land of nothing. Then, in August of 2005, I had an extended business trip planned. I would spend a week in San Diego, followed by a week in New Orleans, then a week in Atlanta, a week in Washington, D.C., and finally a week in New York City. Since I'm a rail fan, I decided to do the whole trip via Amtrak. I booked a roomette, a small private room about four foot by six foot. It contained two seats that folded into a bed. The official reason for the roomette was medical. I use a CPAP machine to breathe at night. The real reason was personal. I packed a Grundig YB400 shortwave radio, the Yaesu FT817, a Yaesu VX5, a Yaesu FT60, an ICOM ICT2H, a Radio Shack scanner, a Grundig Yachtboy 300 shortwave radio, and a Midland CB walkie-talkie. I also brought telescopic gain antennas, battery chargers, and a generous supply of nickel metal hydride and alkaline batteries. I would have a private coast-to-coast -coast ham shack paid for by my employer. I had a blast on my way to California. Although I couldn't work HF from inside the rail car, I had dozens of QSOs on 2 meters and 70 centimeters. On many occasions, the tracks were parallel to an interstate. I would work the truckers on CB Channel 19. In one contact, the trucker kept pace with the train for 10 miles as we talked. On the prairies of Illinois and Kansas, I had simplex QSOs that covered 20 miles or more. I used the ICOM ICT2H, which I consider the most sensitive 2-meter handheld ever made, to listen to marine traffic on the Great Lakes and on the Mississippi River, as well as to scan the railroad frequencies. I checked out the local AM and FM stations, listened to VHF TV audio, tuned in shortwave broadcasts, listened to the airports, and scanned the public service bands. And I got paid for it. But in the back of my mind, I knew that this trip would also bring me to the land of nothing. I left California one week later on Amtrak's Sunset Limited. This train follows the Union Pacific's main line through Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. From El Paso to Del Rio, the train passed through the most desolate areas of Texas. It also went through Marfa, Texas, home of the famous and mysterious Marfa Lights. These are lights that appear on the horizon at night in the foothills of the mountains. They float, hover, and dart back and forth. They have been documented for more than 120 years, and to this day, no one knows what causes them. In my heart, 
I knew that Marfa, Texas, was the location of the land of nothing. Unfortunately, the train was scheduled to pass through Marfa before sunset, unless it was delayed. And it was. The Union Pacific Line is a single track, with passing sidings every 30 miles or so. As eastbound and westbound trains approached, one would pull into the siding to let the other pass. Now, under the agreements that Amtrak has with freight lines, passenger trains have priority over freight trains. In reality, it doesn't work that way, especially on that particular line. It takes a long time to stop a 100-car freight train and a lot of energy to get it moving again. Furthermore, the line from east to west climbs a continuous grade. As a result, the Union Pacific dispatcher always put the Sunset Limited into the siding and let the freight trains pass. Sometimes we would be in the siding for hours while a parade of westbound freights went by. We left El Paso, Texas at 11 p.m., several hours behind schedule. I was dozing in my roomette, the ICOM IC-T2H scanning the rail channels. Somewhere around 2 a.m., we went into a siding to let a westbound freight pass. Then, the dispatcher called us and said he was keeping us in the hole for another westbound about one hour away. Suddenly, I was wide awake. This might be the moment. I knew from monitoring the rail frequencies that we were near Marfa and about 30 miles from Alpine, Texas. I quickly brought out all the radios and assigned each one of them a particular frequency. The Grundig Yacht Boy 400 got the shortwave spectrum, while its little brother, the Yacht Boy 300, was given the AM and FM broadcast bands. The Radio Shack scanner was assigned 30 to 54 megahertz as primary, with 108 to 138 and 440 to 512 megahertz as secondary. The ICOM ICT2H was assigned the VHF high band, including 2 meters and the rail frequencies. The Yaesu FT60 was assigned 440 through 470 megahertz as primary, with aircraft band as secondary. The Midland CB got the 26.965 to 27.405 range. The Yesu VX-5 was given the VHF and UHF TV audio, the military aircraft band, and the 800 MHz segment. Finally, the Yesu FT-817 was assigned all its memory channels in the HF, 6-meter, and 2-meter bands. For the first 10 minutes or so, I was busy. The Midland and the VX-5 had to manually be tuned through their assigned ranges. I was constantly switching radios from their primary to secondary assignments. On some of the more esoteric frequencies, such as TV audio, military aircraft, and 800 MHz, I made only one sweep. The AM-FM broadcast bands, CB, and the VHF low bands received three full searches. Shortwave, aircraft, VHF high, and the UHF bands received almost continuous coverage. For the cellular frequencies, I pulled out my cell phone. As I expected, I got a no-service message. After the first 10 minutes, I settled in on the core frequencies of shortwave, aircraft, VHF high, and UHF. The Midland was parked on CB channel 19, and the FT-817 continued to march through its memory channels. I put the radios on the folding table by the window. I then shut off all the lights in my roomette and even unplugged the nightlight. It was now pitch black, inside and outside. The train was absolutely silent. I was in the last car, so I couldn't hear the engine. I leaned back in the chair and allowed the darkness and silence to embrace me. I began to feel disconnected from the world and even from my own senses. I began to think that I was the last person on earth and that the blackness and silence would last forever. At one point a wave of fear passed over me and I had to resist the urge to pick up the radios and start calling someone. The fear passed, and once again I was at peace with my surroundings. I lost track of space and time. The darkness was my blanket, and the silence was a reassuring friend. I convinced myself that this would never end. Unfortunately, it did. After 30 minutes of total sensory deprivation, 
the ICOM ICT2H jarred me back to the real world when it picked up the defect detector triggered by the westbound freight. A minute later, the dispatcher came on and contacted us. Then, a low rumble that grew louder as the freight train passed us. Finally, the dispatcher gave us permission to move. I sat up, turned on the lights, and shut off all the radios except for the ICOM. I was back in the real world. Note, purists will claim that my test was flawed. They will point out that I was in a steel rail car and only using telescopic antennas. If I were outside with larger antennas, I would hear signals on medium wave and short wave. In addition, they will also say I didn't check any frequency higher than 900 megahertz and that I would have received satellite transmissions if I had the proper receivers. I do not dispute the fact that the test was not perfect. I will point out, however, that under the same conditions, I received hundreds of signals on other parts of my journey. This trip on Amtrak was almost 8,000 miles, and Marfa, Texas, was the only location that I heard nothing. My only regret was that I did not see the Marfa lights. That would have made the surreal moment complete. The rest of the trip, radio-wise, was anticlimactic. Once again, I was active on 2 meters, 440, and CB, as well as scanning shortwave and the public service bands. I even had a handful of 10 meter and 6 meter QSOs. I had achieved the land of nothing. I had no desire to return. When I finally arrived home weeks later, many hams asked me what I had heard and worked on my coast to coast radio quest. I smiled and softly said, Nothing. Absolutely nothing. They didn't understand and perhaps never will. One final note. This was my first time in New Orleans. I loved the city and toured it extensively. I sat by the Mississippi River and listened to the marine traffic. I had numerous CUSOs with the local hams. And I left New Orleans on Friday, August 12, 2005, just two, weeks before Hurricane Tr just two weeks before Hurricane Katrina. I would return to New Orleans three months later, but that is another story. This is Bill Continelli. W2XOY for this week in Amateur Radio. You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Now the satellite report, courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. Satellite operators have a lot of fun working through the different satellites. Whether you enjoy FM, SSB, or CW, there is a satellite for you. There is one so-called satellite that many might forget, though. The International Space Station, the ISS, has a brand new radio on board, and you can sometimes get lucky and work an astronaut. The voice and SST downlink worldwide is 145.80 megahertz. The uplink for ITU regions 2 and 3, which includes the Americas, is 144.49 MHz. If you're in region 1, that's Europe, Africa, and the Mideast, the uplink is 145.20. When the packet system is turned on, the uplink and downlink for VHF is 145.825 MHz worldwide. If the UHF packet is turned on, the uplink and downlink is 437.55 MHz. The last mode available is the VU repeater. The uplink is 145.99 MHz with a PL tone of 67 Hz. The downlink is 437.80. Signals are always very strong, and they are all FM. Radio amateurs in New Zealand no longer have access to 60 meters, effective on October 24th. Use of the band by radio amateurs in New Zealand is provisional, allowing hams there to use two frequencies in the band, 5353 kHz and 5362 kHz, as part of a trial. New Zealand Amateur Radio Transmitters, the National Amateur Radio Organization, said the New Zealand Defense Force advised the organization that it was not willing to approve another renewal of the 5 MHz trial allocation. NZART has indicated that it will continue to work with telecoms regulator RSM to see if other ways may be available to provide access to 5 MHz frequencies by New Zealand amateurs. As in the U.S., 
The federal government and military are primary on the 5 MHz band. According to NZART, the decision was not made lightly by the New Zealand Defense Force, but access to that part of the HF spectrum is very important to support the New Zealand Defense Force's new platforms, tactical radio equipment, and updated HF site equipment in the delivery chain. Additionally, access to HF is a key part of their communications plans both in New Zealand and to support our forces overseas, NZART explained. While this is a disappointing outcome, NZART would like to thank the New Zealand Defense Force for allowing us to take part in the trial, and we look forward to working with them in the future on matters of common interest. A new frequency measuring test mode added to the digital communication program FL Digi, developed by Dave Fries, W1HKJ, makes the program useful for the frequency measuring test on November 13th. The new test mode replaces frequency analysis mode, making FL Digi useful for frequency measuring test participants. FL Digi can still measure an unknown frequency to three decimal places, but it can also use a reference frequency to correct the unknown calculation for inaccuracies of the receiver. Very little equipment is necessary to participate in the frequency measuring test. A software-defined radio accessed by the internet will work. Check out the GPS-stabilized SDRs and Kiwi SDRs. A hardware cable or a virtual cable can connect the SDR audio to the FL Digi input. Calibration will be required. While older rigs can be used, FL Digi works best with a rig that can be controlled by a serial or USB connection from the PC to set the VFO with 1 Hz resolution. Some rigs display frequency to 1 Hz. Others only display to 10 Hz, but can be set by the PC to 1 Hz. Most rigs dating from about 1995 and later will work well. FL Digi needs to know the frequency that the radio thinks it is tuned to, or the frequency that you think it is tuned to. The new frequency measuring test modem works best with a reference signal injected along with the frequency measuring test transmitted signal, the FMT's unknown signal. The reference signal must have some accurately known frequency that can be set near the unknown frequency within 1 kHz or so. The reference can be a signal generator stabilized by a GPS disciplined oscillator that can easily be set to output a useful frequency. Using FL Digi's new FMT modem without a reference can still provide good results but requires careful calibration. ARRL sponsored earlier frequency measuring tests. The first ARRL frequency measuring test took place in 1931. Back then it was required that official observers participate and meet certain standards. The FCC has adopted a report and order that allows AM radio stations to operate using all digital broadcast signals. AM broadcasters will be able to voluntarily choose whether and when to convert to all digital operation from their current analog or hybrid analog digital signals, the FCC said. All digital broadcasting offers AM listeners significantly improved audio quality and more reliable coverage over a wider listenable area than analog or hybrid digital broadcasts. It also allows broadcasters to provide additional services to the public, such as song title and artist information. Researchers are calling the work of scientists at the University of York a potential game changer in the world of solar panels. By putting a checkerboard design on the panel's face, researchers have upgraded its ability to absorb light by 125%. According to a report posted on the website goodnewsnetwork.org, the panel could possibly be developed to absorb far more solar energy than today's panels. Replacing the traditional flat panel surface with a checkerboard design is said to increase the diffraction rate and thus the likelihood that more light can be absorbed. The research team believes this could result in panels that are thinner, lighter, and more flexible. The team's findings were published recently in the journal Optica. Charles Clifford K. Hart, W4KKP of White Rock, South Carolina, died on October 26th, a few days past his 109th birthday. An ARRL member, he was the oldest known U.S. radio amateur and possibly the oldest ham in the world. 
Last November, Roanoke Division Director Bud Hipsley, W2RU, Vice Director Bill Maureen, N2COP, and South Carolina Section Manager Mark Tarpley, N4UFP, jointly presented K-Hart with AWRL Centurion Award, which honors centenarian members with at least 40 years of AWRL membership. On that occasion, Hipsley interviewed K-Hart, first licensed in 1937 as W2LFE in New Jersey. He also held W9GNQ. According to his obituary, K-Hart built his first radio at the age of nine. After working for New York Telephone Company as a young man, he became enamored with engineering, so he headed off to Tri-State University in Indiana, graduating with a degree in aeronautical engineering. Afterward, he went to work for RCA in New Jersey, becoming a quality control manager. Positions followed at Philco Radio and Bendix Aviation. During World War II, K. Hart joined the U.S. Army Signal Corps, which sent him off to school to study radar. He was assigned to the U.S. Army Air Corps in Georgia and then sent to Hawaii to become part of the Signal Service Battalion. He served at Iwo Jima shortly after the U.S. victory there, setting up equipment for long-range radio communication and broadcasting with rhombic antennas in four directions. In 1946, K. Hart left the Army with the rank of captain joining Magnavox the following year as his first field engineer. At the time, Magnavox was about to launch a line of television sets. Eventually, he was transferred to the Customer Acceptance Department in Tennessee. K. Hart traveled to Japan in 1963 in search of Japanese television sets. He retired from Magnavox in 1976. In the 1970s, while living in Tennessee, he spearheaded a project that installed a 2-meter FM repeater on the summit of Camp Creek Bald, still in operation on the Tennessee-North Carolina border. After K. Hart moved into an assisted living facility in 2017, he had an HF station in his room, courtesy of the Dutch Fork Amateur Radio Group, to which he belonged, and the Columbia Amateur Radio Club. K. Hart remained active on the air until shortly before he died. According to his obituary, K. Hart was also the oldest surviving Iwo Jima veteran and eighth oldest living U.S. male. He was also the oldest man on the South Carolina Honor flight trip to Washington, D.C. K. Hart was profiled in the June 2018 issue of QST. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Hey, guess what? I can't see the VU meter for where I am, so I'm going to have to just kind of wing it. I wanted to do a segment for this series while working on a tower, but as usual, Mother Nature changed my mind. So here we are again from the comfy confines of good old Studio B. As winter sets in where you live, we're often reminded of those nasty little chores we put off all summer up on our ham towers, and I'm no exception to this rule. I always put off for winter what could be more easily done during the summer. The fall is actually a good time for tower work. In many parts of the USA, there are predictable dry spells during the change of seasons. The slowing of grass and weeds gives us a good chance to inspect the tower base bolts, clamps, and any grounding hardware. This is also a good time for spraying a good amount of herbicide around tower bases, grounding systems, fences, guy anchors, and other tower parts. It's also a good time to look down on the ground around the base of the tower for any parts that may have broken off during the summer storms that you may have not noticed from a distance. It's a good idea to always keep the tower base area free from debris and junk. So anything falling from the tower is immediately visible. Tell the person that mows the grass to always watch for stuff on the ground. Keep it picked up and report anything he finds on the ground. A clean gravel ground cover around the tower base is in your best interest as a tower owner or tower user. So go outside tomorrow and clean up everything around the base of the tower. Make sure everyone else that works around the tower does the same thing. This is one of the best ways to notice problems before they appear on the radio waves. This is the season for a final trip up the tower for a pre-winter inspection of the antennas, feed lines, waterproofing, and of the tower hardware too. Take the basic tower work tools, antenna work tools, and coax installing, securing, and waterproofing items too. Take your time and check every clamp, every coax connection on all sides. Jiggle everything with your hand to inspect for tightness. 
Be careful not to grab any active antennas while doing your annual inspection. It is not uncommon for things to vibrate loose during the year, and this may be your last chance to climb for months or more. So take care of it before winter's worst weather gets here. Sometimes that last climb of the year is during light rain or wind. I'll climb during some wind, but prefer not to. Sometimes I don't have a choice. If you're a once a year climber and have never gone up in a stout wind and are easily made seasick, you may want to reconsider climbing in the wind. On an unguide, self-supporting tower in the wind, the tower sways around, which causes you to feel dizzy and wobbly. When you're on the tower, above the tree line, there are no references around you to let you know that you're moving. And since the tower and you are both swaying at the same rate, while the tower may actually be swaying several inches, it looks like you're sitting perfectly still. This optical illusion can make your head spin or feel dizzy. If you're used to it, this, there's no problem. But if you're easily made nauseated and you're only holding onto the tower with your hands, it could cost you your life if you suddenly had to vomit while climbing. So if you're the kind of person who gets motion sickness easily, you may want to avoid climbing during winds more than a gentle breeze. Just be patient and wait for better weather. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Here's the list of upcoming AWRL Learning Network webinars. You can visit the AWRL Learning Network website to register for upcoming sessions and to view previously recorded sessions. The following schedule is subject to change. How to Get Started in Amateur Radio Contesting, hosted by Andy Luskray, K8ZT. Why do hams participate in on-air contests? How would I benefit from contesting? What do I need to get started in contesting? What are the good contests for beginners? Where can I learn more? This session will answer all of these questions and more. The webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020 at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 1800 UTC. Amateur Radio's role at the Boston Marathon bombing hosted by Steve Schwarm, W3EVE. Amateur Radio has played a significant role in public service communications for the Boston Marathon for several decades. That role was put to test in 2013 when two bombs were exploded near the finish line. This presentation will describe the role that ham radio played at the marathon and how that role changed during the bombing. This webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, December 8, 2020, at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or 1800 UTC. Learn and have fun with Morse code, hosted by Howard Bernstein, WB2UZE, and Jim Kreitz, W6JIM. Morse code, or CW, is a popular ham radio operating mode. Learning CW does not have to be an arduous or lonely experience. Learn, practice, and enjoy CW with the methods used by the Long Island CW Club. This webinar is scheduled for Thursday, December 17th of 2020 from 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, that's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or 0100 UTC on Friday, December 18th. The Federal Communications Commission has moved, even though many amateurs probably didn't know where it was to begin with. The new FCC headquarters address is 45 L Street Northeast, Washington, D.C., 20554. The change is effective immediately. The FCC announced plans to move last spring, but the transaction was delayed by the ongoing pandemic. The Federal Communications Commission, like many federal agencies, has its own zip code, so there will be no disruption of mail delivery sent by the United States Postal Service to the former address. The FCC still prohibits the delivery of hand-carried documents and all pandemic restrictions or instructions regarding access to FCC facilities remain in place at the new location. The Commission continues to balance its efforts to be accessible to the public with a need for heightened security and health and safety measures, and encourages the use of the Commission's electronic comment filing system to facilitate the filing of applications and other documents when possible, the FCC said in an October 15th public notice. 
Due to the pandemic, the move was accomplished by professional movers without the presence of any employees, all of whom had been working from home. An attempt was made during the summer to let employees back into headquarters for a day to pack up their offices and remove personal belongings, but that plan had to be scrapped after several employees tested positive. Most FCC staff continue to work from home and are not expected to be physically present in their new offices before next June. In anticipation of the planned move, the FCC last spring also announced the adoption of a new FCC seal. The redesign is the product of an agency-wide contest that solicited proposals from employees and contractors. The revised design incorporates several elements, communications technologies, four stars on the outer seal border drawing from the legacy of the predecessor Federal Radio Commission seal, retaining the three-wire dipole supported by two towers, 18 stars on the shield, recognizing the current number of bureaus and offices, and the eagle and shield identifying the FCC as a federal government agency. Official use of the new seal was to begin following completion of the Commission's move from the portals to its new location on L Street Northeast. The Radio Amateur Society of Australia wrote to the president of the International Amateur Radio Union on the 1st of October over the chronic interference to the 40-meter band in Region 3. The great majority of intruder stations speak Indonesian and do not identify. They operate in the bottom half of 40 meters using upper sideband, often in 10 kilohertz multiples. These stations are received continuously in Darwin, Australia, and every afternoon and evening in the remainder of the Australian continent. They are causing harmful interference to Australian amateur stations. They would also be causing harmful interference to amateur stations right across Southeast Asia, Papua New Guinea, and Micronesia. Radio Amateur Society of Australia first reported this problem to the IARU Region 3 chairman two years ago. In the intervening period, the interference has increased in severity. It appears that the popularity of digital modes around 7065 to 7075 kilohertz is forcing the illegal stations down into the CW segment below 7050 kilohertz. Radio Amateur Society of Australia again reported the issue to Region 3 IARU chairman on the 2nd of September, but have not received a reply. The Radio Amateur Society of Australia approached the Australian regulator, the ACMA, last year on the issue and asked them to conduct their own monitoring with a view to a formal complaint through the International Telecommunications Union process. Unfortunately, the Radio Amateur Society of Australia were advised that, due to staff cutbacks, the ACMA was unable to conduct the requested monitoring. In the absence of formal government regulatory action, Radio Amateur Society of Australia's view is that the IARU, as the regional umbrella organization, should take a proactive role in resolving the issue. The Radio Amateur Society of Australia suggested in their letter to the International Amateur Radio Union President that the IARU and the Indonesian National Radio Amateur Society should formulate a plan of action and offer to assist as required. A reply has not been received to date. And finally this week, it looks like amateur radio operators in the United States may be getting their own national holiday thanks to one Arizona lawmaker. Congresswoman Debbie Lesko has introduced a resolution to declare April 18, 2021 as National Amateur Radio Operators Day, recognizing ham radio as a means for teaching, for communicating, and for spurring the development of new innovations. The Congresswoman presented the measure just days after attending a virtual event hosted by the Sun City Grand Hams based in Surprise, Arizona. The date is timed to coincide with the anniversary of the founding of the International Amateur Radio Union. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater, W2GBO, on 146.940 MHz, serving the Tri-Cities of New York State's Capital Region. 
This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates, Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates, Incorporated. All rights reserved. You've just listened to a truncated version of This Week in Amateur Radio. Please visit TWIAR.net for the full version.